Westinghouse Studio One Summer Theater. Westinghouse, the name that means sureness. Whether it's on vacuum cleaners for America's homes or electric trolley coaches for our cities, whether it's a product for your home, for your business, for your farm, or for your factory, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. <laughs> can never return to Thornfield Manor. And since I cannot, I have tried for a long time now to shut out the past. But I can no more not remember than I can change the direction of the wind. For all things conspire to serve the journey into the past, even the wind itself. For as the wind howls around me now, so it did that first day, the day I traveled from Lowood School to Thornfield Manor. It was a bitter cold wind which swept down from the moors, numbing my fingers and rattling the frail carriage in which I was traveling. But neither the cold nor the long journey could dampen my spirits that day. For every turn of the wheel was taking me further away from my bleak path, and nearer to a new life. But as we drew nearer and nearer, my excitement mounted. Almost I, I held my breath, so eager I was to catch my first glimpse of Thornfield Manor. Good evening. I was told to ask for the housekeeper, Mrs. Fairfax. My dear, Mrs. Fairfax. Yes, and you must be Jane Eyre. John, will you take Miss Eyre's bag to her room? Why, you must be numb with cold. Leah, do bring some tea. This is such a beautiful house. I've never seen a house like it before. Yes, it's a fine old hall, but lonely sometimes and cold. Perhaps you'll bring warmth to it. Do come in by the fire. The little girl. Yes, this is your pupil, Miss Hare. <laughs> I'm afraid she's fallen asleep waiting for you. She's prattled of nothing all week but your coming. Seems a pity to waken her. Oh, but she has to go up to bed. Besides, she'd be most unhappy if she didn't meet you tonight. Adele. Adele, dear. Wake up. See who's here. Miss Eyre has come. Good evening, Miss Eyre. Good evening, Adele. I hope we're going to be good friends. Are you from Paris too, Miss Eyre? No, Adele. Is that where you were born? I lived there long ago with Mama. Mama has gone to the Holy Virgin. She taught me to sing and dance and say verses. Well, then you shall sing and say a piece for me tomorrow. I only sing for Mr. Rochester. Well, very well. Then you shall sing for him. Well, now I think it's time for you to go up to bed. Good night, Miss Eyre. Sleep well. Good night, Miss Good night, Adele. Now run along. Come along, Miss Adele. Time for bed. She's a nice child. Yes, and she'd be grateful for your company. Now do take off your things and sit down and have some tea. I too.
too should be grateful for your company. But truthfully, we're much alone here. Mr. Rochester is away so much in Europe. Shall I be required to meet him tonight? Oh, dear, no. He's been away these past three months. He, he returns every now and then for a week or so, and then he's off again. Oh, so beautiful here. I shouldn't think he'd wish to be away ever. Well, it appears to him to be too gloomy. Oh, I do not think so. Do you have any knowledge of when he'll return this time? Oh, no. Mr. Rochester's visits, Miss Eyre, are unexpected and sudden, like everything about him unpredictable. Forgive me if I seem to be asking too many questions. Oh, well, of course, you're interested. Actually, I don't suppose there's a finer man in all Yorkshire. Though there are many who find him strange and even a little forbidding. Strange in what respect? Just one of the servants, Grace Poole, woman we have here to help with the sewing. And now I'm sure you're more than ready to retire to your room. I am a little tired. I put you in one of the guest rooms to make you as comfortable as you are accustomed. Well, Mrs. Fairfax, I am accustomed to very little. But you are not one of the servants. You are a person of refinement, and I hope you'll look on Thornfield as your home. Now, come along. My room is near yours, so if you should be nervous during the night, you won't be surprised. Thornfield, like all old houses, sometimes has strange stirring. was that night. The warmth of my reception, the loveliness of my room made me feel that I, that I could not do enough to show my gratitude. Indeed, Mrs. Fairfax could not even have imagined how that little room looked to my eyes, eyes which had looked for so long on the bleakness of an orphanage. I felt even then that I could come to love that house as though it were my own. And then it happened. I heard it for the first time. You shouldn't be here. I'm sorry. Miss Eyre! Oh, Miss Eyre! Miss Eyre, did something disturb you? I thought I heard a strange laugh. Too much noise, Grace. Remember directions. Well, come to your room, my dear. Get some rest. You must go back to bed. You've had a long, tiring journey. Good night. in the house. You want to? Yeah. If you, if you're hungry, and if you're a good girl, and if you know how to spell the word correctly, I shall let you go and ask Mrs. Fairfax for one. A P P L E. Good for you. Good girl. Run along, dear. I 
do any good. My confounded horse has taken a notion to throw me and run off. Well, Who the deuce are you? You're hurt, sir, and what help I can fetch from you can't travel further in this condition. Thank you. I have no broken bones, only a sprain. You are not a servant at the hall, of course. You are... The governess, sir. The governess? Well, you may help me if you'd be so kind. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Necessity compels me to make you useful. No maidenly scruples at the sight of blood, eh? I should be of little assistance to you in a swoon, sir. I'll help you into the house. Your master may not take kindly to the freedom with which you dispense his hospitality. My master is away, sir, but if he were here, he'd not have me leave you unaided. Oh, you take him to be a kindly man, then? I've never met him, sir. If you'll forgive my saying so, you'd do better to talk less and save your strength. Mr. Rochester! Oh, sir, you're hurt! John, John, come quickly! Quickly! That was my first meeting with the master of Thornfield Manor. And it is as vivid in my mind's eye as if it were, were only now taking place. I remember it puzzled me that I had failed to recognize him until suddenly I realized the descriptions I had heard were not accurate. Abrupt he was, but he did not seem at all a forbidding man. Be seated. Miss Eyre, I can't see you there without disturbing my position in this very comfortable chair, which I have no mind to do. Sit there, if you please, that is, if you please. Confound these civilities. I continually forget them. Miss Eyre, I've examined Adele and find that you've taken great pains with her. She's not bright. She has no talent. And yet, in a short time, she shows much improvement. I am... I am obliged to you, sir. It is a reward teachers most covet. Praise of their pupils' progress. Mm. I see. You have been resident in my house three months. Yes, sir. And you come from? From Lowwood School, sir. Ah. Uh, a charitable institution. How long were you there? Since I was a child, sir. That's right. You must be tenacious of life. No wonder you have the look of another world. I marveled this afternoon where you had got that sort of face. Who are your parents? I have none, sir. Nor ever had, I suppose. Do you remember them? Do you remember them? No. And your home? I have none, sir. Who recommended you to come here? I answered Mrs. Fairfax's advertisement. Mm. Well, now, uh, what did you learn at Lowood? Can you play? A little, sir. Of course, that is the established answer. Go over to the spinet. Go over to the spinet, if you please. Excuse my tone of command. Go over to the spinet and play a tune, if you please. Enough, enough. You play a little, as you say. You examine me, Miss Eyre. Do you find me handsome? No, sir. Well, by my word, there is something singular about you. One asks you a question and you wrap out a round rejoinder, which, if not blunt, is at least brusque. What do you mean by it? I was, I was too plain, sir. I beg your pardon. What faults do you find with no, me? Uh, Mr. Rochester, allow me to disown my reply. It was only a blunder. <laughs> Just so. I think so. You're not nervous with me, are you? No, sir. Should I be? It's good you are not. 
This is not a household for anyone subject to nervousness. You look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre. And though you are no more pretty than I am handsome, yet a puzzled air becomes you. Good night. Good night, sir. Adele. Well, I can't be sure she's right unless I count on my fingers. Do I have to do any more arithmetic today? Indeed you do. We'll not go for a walk until you're finished. Oh, Miss Adele. Oh, Adele, no yes. arguments. May I have your lunch on the table? Run along now. Will Mr. Rochester be returning this evening? Mm -hmm. So he said. But if Lady Ingram's ball lost as well in the night, he may have decided to stay another day. Oh, I hope not. He promised you would let me sing for him. And so you shall, you shall, you shall. But run along now, run oh, along. Oh, Mr. Rochester, we didn't expect you so soon. I must see that some lunch is prepared for Do, do, thank you. Come along, Mr. Rochester. Oh, Miss Eyre, Miss Eyre. Will you favor me with your presence in the library this evening? Speak, Miss Eyre. Young lady, I am in a mood to be gregarious and communicative tonight. I've almost forgotten you since I first invited you down. Other ideas have driven yours from my head. It would please me now to draw you out to learn more of you. Therefore, speak. What about, sir? <laughs> In truth, there is something singular about you with your quiet, grave eyes. You never laugh. Only when I am amused, sir. I beg your pardon. I have been abrupt. Will you, con will you consent to dispense with a great many conventional forms and phrases with me without thinking that that omission arises from insolence? I'm sure, sir, I should never mistake informality for insolence. One I rather like, the other, nothing freeborn would submit to even for a salary. Humbug. Most things freeborn will submit to anything for a salary. However, I mentally shake hands with you for your answer, despite its inaccuracy. Now, I envy you. I envy you your peace of mind, your clean conscience, your unpolluted memory. Do you know why Adele is here? No, sir. It has been affirmed that she is my daughter. That does not shock you. Well, you have told me so yourself, sir, which provides a reason that there can be no great sin attached to it. Well, as it happens, you are right. She is the daughter of a French opera dancer for whom I once cherished a, a grand passion. When I heard that she had abandoned a child and run off to Italy with a musician, a singer, I took the child out of Paris and brought her here. To grow up clean in the wholesome soil of an English country garden. I suppose now you'll be coming to me with notice to be on the lookout for a new governess and etc., eh? Why, oh, no, sir. Adele is not answerable for her mother's faults or yours. I... I have a regard for the child, and now that I know that she is, in a sense, parentless, I shall cling closer to her than before. That's the light in which you view it. Strange that I should make you for a confidant of all this. Passing strange that you should listen to me as though it were the most natural thing in the world. You were made to be a recipient of secrets, Miss Eyre. 
Do you like this house? Yes, sir. Seems to me. Splendid mansion, sir. <laughs> the glamour of inexperience is over your eyes. How long have I abhorred the thought of Thornfield? How I have shunned it like a great plague house. Plague house. How I do still abhor it. And yet, here with you, everything is sweet, pure, real. I shall like Thornfield. I dare like it. I shall break obstacles to happiness. Excuse me. You will leave me? Half nine. Good night. What have you done with me? They'll smoke you. Might have been burned to death in your sleep. I'll fetch Mrs. Stair. No, 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 no. What the deuce for? But then I'd better awaken Leah. What good would she do? No. Stay where you are. Stay here. Rochester, I heard a strange, a terrifying laugh, one that I have heard before. Did you see anything? No, sir. Only this candle burning on the floor outside my door. Young lady. Young lady. I'm glad that you're the only one. The only one who has seen tonight's incident. You heard no, no other thing, only this odd laugh. Yes, sir. Mr. Rochester, who was it? Who is Grace Poole? So you've guessed it has something to do with Grace Poole. Young lady, no more, no more. I am glad, as I say, that you are the only one aware of the full details of tonight's incident. You are no talking fool. You will say nothing about it. You have saved my life. I have a pleasure in owing you so immense a debt. There is no debt in the case, sir. Good night. Good night, Jane.
seen part one of Jane Eyre, let's turn to our Westinghouse program and Augusta Dabney for vacationing Betty Furness. You're richer than you think. Say, that's good to hear. How come? Well, if you have an old refrigerator out in your kitchen, it's worth a lot of money when you trade it in on the world's finest self-defrosting refrigerator, the completely automatic Westinghouse Frost Free. And what's more, you can buy a genuine Frost Free for as much as $50 less than other refrigerators that still leave you part of the defrosting job to do. For instance, with many refrigerators that claim to be fully automatic, you'll find a container like this. Well, it collects the defrost water, and you have to keep emptying it. But with the wonderful Westinghouse Frost Free, there's nothing for you to do. And there's nothing for you to empty because the defrost water evaporates automatically. Now, I know the Frost Free is the refrigerator that you'll want, so let me show you how to identify it. You look for the famous magic button. That's the sign of the Frost Free system exclusive with Westinghouse. Now, you never have to touch that button because it automatically counts the door opening. You know, every time you open your door, warm, moist air enters the refrigerator and, and causes frost. Well, after the door's been opened and shut enough times for a small amount of frost to form on the freezer, the magic button automatically gives the signal that starts the frost-free system working. And every bit of frost disappears so fast that your frozen foods in the freezer always stay firmly frozen. Now, isn't that wonderful? So why don't you trade in that old refrigerator on a brand new Westinghouse Frost Free? And remember, you can buy a new refrigerator on such easy terms today. And remember too, there's a Frost Free model in a size for every kitchen and a price for every purse. And of course, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. We return now to Westinghouse Studio One Summer Theater and Jane Eyre. There is no turning back once you have started down the path of remembrance. Nothing to do but go on until the end brings you back where you began. I had both wished and feared to see Mr. Rochester after that strange night in the library. I was determined there would be no change in my deportment. I would take no advantage of the secret he had been forced to share with me. It was not until a night a month later that my feelings burst the bonds of restraint I had placed upon them. There were guests that night, and as was the custom, I made an appearance in the library after dinner. Mrs. Fairfax had confided to me that the guest of honor was the lady Mr. Rochester would marry eventually when he decided to settle down. Well, tell me, if you're not fond of children, why then did you adopt one? Circumstances beyond my control made it unavoidable. You could send her away to school. Oh, I could not do that. Schools are so dear. Oh, how foolishly you talk. They're no more expensive than having a governess. Oh, <laughs> my dearest, don't speak of governesses. Oh, my dear, when I think of what I've suffered from them, their, their incompetency, their, their utter lack of... What? Oh, indeed. <laughs> well, I hope she benefits by it. <laughs> yes, I've noticed her. You know, I'm a very good judge of faces. And in hers, I see all the faults of her. <laughs> Class. What are they, madam? Oh, I'll oh, tell you. Gracious, yes, Mama Sarah. <laughs> I move the introduction of a new topic. Mr. Rochester, do you second my motion? Oh, madam, I support you on this point as on every other. Hmm. Will you play for us? Anything to prevent Mama boring us with her tales of tribulations with servants. <laughs> <laughs> Such an impetuous child and so gifted. She'd be an acquisition to any man. Uh -huh. Don't you think so, Mr. Rochester? Indeed. Who could deny a statement so obviously true? What has come over you, sir? You're not usually given to such pretty speeches. Perhaps I'm endeavoring to compete with your many admirers. Oh, you need not bother to do so. In truth, I am sick of the young men of today. Weaklings with pretty little hands and white faces, full of flattery and mincing ways. I like a man to be a man, a good huntsman, a fine shot, one ready to take a fight. For all 
your pretty speeches, sir, you're not very attentive. Perhaps my playing bores you. Oh, madam, how could that be? Even I, who am not musical, have only to watch you to see your ability. I do not wish to play anymore. Come. I've not had you alone since I've arrived, and, and you've been away so long. And have no doubt missed many gay events. Oh, <laughs> Perfect match. Perfect, my dear. And thoroughbred, both of them. The crossing of the best blood in the county. <laughs> Don't you be... Oh, I'm so proud of the whole thing. Jane. Jane, you catch cold in the night air. Why do you stand here in the garden? Still night is conducive to still thoughts, Mrs. Fairfax. Jane, you sound sad. I am sad, Mrs. Stop Fairfax. Stop like you. I love cornfields, and I must leave. Leave it? Mrs. Fairfax, you are my friend, are you not? Well, I hope I am, Jane. Then I can tell you. Mr. Rochester. Oh, Jane, dear. I'm deeply sorry for you. Had you so mistaken his interest in you? I do not think so. He's a lonely man, and you were a ready listener. That he liked. It's nothing more, Jane. No, it's nothing more. I know I'm not beautiful and gifted like Blanche Ingram, but though she smiles so lavishly on him, I do not think she truly feels anything deeply. Jane, Mr. Rochester has a fortune, and the Lady Ingram has lately been impoverished. She will not let him go where she can do what to hold him. Does she love him? Oh, Jane, child, No, please child. do not pity me, Mrs. Smith. Oh, my dear. Give me. Jane. Mrs. Fairfax. Why did you leave the room? You're deserting too early. It is not my wish. I beg pardon. Why did you leave? I was I'm tired. And a little depressed. What about? It? Tell me. It's nothing. I'm not depressed. Oh, you are. You are. So much so that a few more words would bring tears to your eyes. What does all this mean? Am I not your friend? Yes, sir. Well, then. You are my friend. Edward. Do you plan to present us for an entire evening? Well, tonight I excuse you. Is the habit of a gentleman of your means and position to spend his time talking with servants? Sarah's no more. Thornfield will not seem the same without you. Very kind of you, Leah. Are you going to a new position, ma'am? Well, yes, I have heard of a position in Ireland. Oh, they say Ireland is lovely. Is it? Miss Anne, Miss Anne. Oh, why must you go, Miss Anne? Has Mr. Rochester been unkind no, to you? No, Adele, no. But sometimes it is necessary even for very good friends such as we to part. Take me with you, then. No, you know I cannot do that, Adele. Leah, take Adele to the nursery, please. No, I want I to speak to go. Miss Eyre. Oh, yes, you must stay. You go. And I'll come up and see you later before my coach leaves. No, you mustn't cry. It will make Mrs. Hedder unhappy. Mr. Rochester has just returned from driving Lady Ingram and Miss Blanche home. To be gone before he returns? He wishes to see you. Oh, Jean! He was most angry when I told him of your intention to leave. To leave, nevertheless, Mrs. Fairfax. Oh, I understand your feelings, but what will you say to him? I don't know, Mrs. Fairfax. I don't know. Come, come into the garden. So, 
You have decided that you must leave Thornfield. Yes. A pity, but then no doubt you will welcome the change of scene. I will not welcome it, sir, but it's better. And you go to Ireland? I have heard of a position there, sir. So far away? Yes, sir. Sea will be a barrier. To what? From England and to Thornfield and, and... Well? You, sir. Then are you anything akin to me, do you think? Because I have sometimes a, a queer feeling with regard to you. Especially when you're near me as now. And if the sea and 200 miles or so of land should come between us, I... I don't know what I should do. And as for you, you'd forget me. That I never should, sir. And I see the necessity of departure. Where do you see the necessity? In what shape? In the shape of Miss Ingram, sir. Do you think I can stay here and become nothing to you? Do you think I am a, an automaton, a machine without feeling? Do you think because I am poor and plain and obscure that I am soulless and heartless too? Well, you think wrong. I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. Jane. No, I'm not talking to you now through the medium of convention or, or custom. But as if, as if we both stood at God's feet, equal, as we are. As we are, Jane. As we are. So. So, Jane. Yes, so, sir. And yet not so. For you are about to wed one whom I do not believe you love. I would scorn such a union. Let me go. Jane. No, your bride, Miss Ingram, stands between us. Jane, Jane. What love have I for Miss Ingram? None. None. You I love as my own flesh. You small and plain and little and obscure. I entreat you to accept me as a husband. What of Miss Ingram, sir? I feigned courtship with her. You... I wanted to render you as madly in love with me as I was with you. I knew jealousy was the best ally I could call in for the furtherance of that end. Oh, Jane. Jane, be mine. Say yes. You truly love me, sir. I do. I swear. Then you will marry me. You will marry me. Say yes, Jane. Say it quickly. Say yes, Edward, I will be your wife. Say yes, I will be Mrs. Rochester. Tomorrow, say it. Yes, Edward, I will be your wife. I will be Mrs. Rochester in four weeks' time. See Mrs. Poole immediately. Mrs. Poole, uh, tell Mrs. Poole that Mr. Mason has returned from the West Indies and desires to see her. Yes, sir. And what we have heard is correct, it seems. Mr. Mason, this is most unexpected. We didn't know you were in England. On urgent business. Have you seen Mr. Archer? No, we've only just arrived in Thornfield. You come at a most unfortunate time, sir. That is obvious, Mrs. Poole. How is she? Tolerably well, Mr. Mason, at times better than others. You seem very agitated, Mrs. Poole. I don't wish to be caught talking to you without the consent of Mr. Rochester. Then let us go upstairs to your rooms. If you will forgive me, sir, I will take you up the back way. We are less likely to meet other members of the household. Rochester, will you stand on the bride's right side? That's very good. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the sight of God and of his holy tabernacle to join this man and woman. Oh. And if you know oh. of any impediment... There is an impediment. An impediment? This marriage is What illegal. bet you say? 
A previous marriage. Mr. Rochester has a wife living. Who are you? My name is Briggs, a solicitor of Chesney Lane, London. And what proof have you of what you say? I have here an affidavit signed by a client of mine, which reads as follows. I affirm and prove that on the 20th of October, 1842, Edward Fairfax Rochester was married to my sister, Bertha Mason, at Spanish Town, Jamaica. The record of marriage will be found in the register at that church. That if a genuine document may prove that I've been married, but it does not prove that the woman mentioned therein as my wife is still living. She is living in this house at the moment. No. I have a witness to prove the fact. Produce him or get out. His wife is my sister. She's living here at Thornfield. I've just seen her. Oh, enough. Enough, enough. She lives. She lives. She lives, she lives. Now God punishes me as though I had not been punished enough. There will be no wedding today. Again at our Westinghouse program. Have you a second balcony set? Well, I guess watching television on a squint sized screen like that is like being up in the second balcony. Certainly is. You know, with all the exciting events on television these days, it's a shame to feel that you're watching them from so far away. So why don't you get yourself a real front row set, a Westinghouse set with a handsome big screen like this one. Now that's a 21 inch screen, the size that most people want these days. But of course, you know, and I know, that there are lots of 21 inch screens on the market today. It's what's inside the set that counts. What good is a big screen if it plays tricks on you like this? Flutter. Isn't that annoying? Well, Westinghouse has perfected an amazing new development that prevents flutter. It's called the electronic clarifier. And how about when your picture hops like this? Isn't that maddening? Oh, well, that's just another nuisance that you can say goodbye to with Westinghouse and its exclusive electronic clarifier. Well, yes, all the new Westinghouse sets give you clear pictures that stay clear. And here's another Westinghouse exclusive. This special receptor for the new ultra-high frequency channels that are on the way. Now, you just plug this in like an ordinary tube and it will bring those new channels right into your Westinghouse set. Yes, Westinghouse offers you so much that, well, you'll enjoy watching everything lots more when you see it on a Westinghouse set. Like the, well, like the Pick a Winner program that Westinghouse is sponsoring on Thursday evening on CBS. So see the new Westinghouse sets at your dealers tomorrow. And remember, you can, you can trade in your old set on a Westinghouse and you'll buy a new Westinghouse set on such easy terms today. And remember, too, you can be sure if it's Westinghouse. We return now to Westinghouse Studio One Summer Theater and Jane Eyre. I have heard it said that time will soften the harshest memories. Well, perhaps that dreadful scene in the garden is not yet far enough in the past. Certainly it is not yet dimmed or lost one drop of its bitterness. Nor has what happened afterwards in the library. How much longer must we wait? You will wait, you will wait. Miss Poole will bring my wife in just a moment. Is this entirely necessary? Mrs. Poole has said that she is in one of her first worst phases today. Perhaps it would be wrong to bring her from the tower. You will wait! Gentlemen, my wife. Here. 
that has been my life for 15 years. Picked into marriage when I was 20 in the British West Indies in Jamaica. Very shortly, I found out what I had married. Not immediately, but within six months' time, she was as she is now. I thought, foolishly, that I could bring her here to Thornfield and to oblivion. Here I was not known to be married. Such, such is my wife, and such the sole conjugal embrace I am ever to know. And this is what I would have. Well, gentlemen, your business is accomplished. You may leave. Jane, I never meant to wound you thus. I should not have deceived you, but I feared not to. I feared prejudice, I feared... I wanted you safe before hazarding confidences. I am a scoundrel, tell me so. I cannot. I'm tired and sick. What will you do? All this change to about me. I must change... Jane, to... Jane, do not look at me with that frozen, resolute look. Your love can't have changed. No. I wish it had. It would be easier to... Easier to? Miss Leave, Miss Leave you. Of course, of course. You shall not stay here, nor shall I. We shall go away together to the south of France. I have a villa there. Jane, I shall ask nothing of you. Nothing. Only that you stay with me. Yes. Jane, do you mean to go one way in the world and let me go another? I do. Do you mean it now? I do. And now? Yes, yes. Jane. And this is why, if I stayed with you as you desire, I should do wrong. To say otherwise is false. Oh, Jane, it would not be wicked to love me. I would to obey you. And in the end, I'd blame you. I might even come to hate you. I couldn't bear that. Jane, Jane, say no more. You shall not go. I love you. You're tired and hurt. Go to your room. Go to your room and rest. Think over what I've said. Think of the anguish in which you would leave me. Think of it tonight. Tell me tomorrow. Remembering only makes it worse. Will I never be able to put it behind me and go on with my life? Well, I must go on, no matter how little I desire to. Surely in these six months he has begun to forget me. As I must forget. As I must forget. Everyone up, but well, we couldn't find her. She must have taken in to do it head to hide. My God, we can't leave her in. Oh, but you can't go in there, sir. The fire has got too much headway. Oh, you I must. Sir. I must. Oh, I must. Oh, God, stop him. He's killed. Oh, God, stop him.
before we'll be together again. What does it do for my mind to say it is over and my heart will not believe it? You, Mrs. Fairfax. Yes, Mr. Rossiter, you shouldn't be in the grounds alone, sir. Leo or John would have guided you if you'd called them. I can't bear the house. I hear her. I hear her. Restless, rustling movement is in the house. It's as if she were here again. I hear her gown rustling in the hallway. I hear her. Is it twilight now? It's going towards nightfall, sir. Well, I shall sit a while. Oh, let me go. Send Leah to fetch me when it grows dark. Yes, sir. My dearest. Who is it? Who is it? What is it? What is it? Darling. Oh, what sweet delusion is this? What madness? No delusion, no madness. These are very fingers. There must be more of them. It is all here, sir. Her heart, too. God bless you. I'm glad to be so near you again. Jane. Jane. My dear master, I have found you out. I have come back to you at last. I'll never leave you, sir, from this day, never. Jane Hare! Oh, Jane, 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 Jane. 